Good morning. Good morning. David, we're glad that you're here with us this morning. As I mentioned last week, Janice and I have had the opportunity to be at Potter's home about three different occasions. Uh, I spent a lot of time at, at Potter's home when my dad was a minister of uh, the Lehman Avenue Church of Christ when I was growing up. And they do a wonderful work and have throughout the years. Janice and I attended Freed Hardeman College with several young people who were children at Potter's home and they had gone on to Freed Hardeman College. So continue to remember that work, especially remember it in your prayers. We started a series about four weeks ago talking about the corner post of our faith. I talked to you about the fact that, you know, if you build a fence, you've got to make sure that the corners are very strong. You have to ensure that they are reinforced because whatever that you're trying to keep inside can lean on it or push on it. Whether it's also important that you go back from time to time and make sure that those corner posts are strong. You know, we talked about in the beginning that in this series that we looked at the fact that the Lord wants us to have peace. We also looked uh, at the fact that he wants us to have knowledge. We related it to uh, the book of Timothy. When Paul was instructing Timothy, he told him that he needed to make sure that he had been taught from his youth and what he had studied and that he had looked at the whole Bible, the things that he would be able to teach and to preach so that he would know that he was teaching the truth. Those things are important for us. We need strong foundations that we can build on to increase our faith. This morning, our corner post of faith and the final lesson in this series is trust. You know, trust really brings contentment. And contentment that can only come from trusting fully in God. Truth in all seasons, all times, trust in all circumstances. You know, often when life begins dealing me less than I wish it would, sometimes I seek comfort in, good, in, in God through music. And one song that always seems to soothe my heart and speaks to my soul is the song that Randy just sang, the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. You all know that I can't sing very well because I attempt to lead singing here every once in a while. So this morning, I want to read to you the words of this song as a poem. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea pillows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet through trials, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. 
And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumpet shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. This is a beautiful and it's really a very moving song. But when we know the backstory, when you know the backstory about this song, it becomes even more moving. It is well with my soul was written in 1873. And it was written by Horatio, Horatio G. Spafford. Horatio was born on October 20th in 1828 in New York. He grew up to become a very successful lawyer and businessman in Chicago and was heavily invested in real estate. He had a wonderful wife named Anna and five children, one boy and four girls. In 1871, at the height of his professional career, Horatio and Anna's little boy died from pneumonia. Later that year, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed almost all of Horatio's real estate investments. In 1873, Horatio and his family planned a much needed vacation to Europe. Horatio's good friend, Dwight L. Moody, and Ira Sankey were conducting an evangelistic tour in Great Britain, and Horatio planned to help them while his family was visiting there. Although he had planned to travel with his family, some unexpected business came up, and Horatio had to stay behind in Chicago. He sent his wife and four girls, ages 11, 9, 7, and 2, on ahead. Horatio would take another ship as soon as possible and join them in Europe. A few days into their crossing of the Atlantic, their ship, the Villa de Harve, collided with an iron uh, Pearl Scottish ship, the Loch Arn. The Villa de Harve sank within 12 minutes, taking with it 226 of the passengers, including the four Satford children. Tatiana, Bessie, Margaret Lee, and Annie. Anna Satford cabled her husband a simple message, saved alone. What shall I do? Horatio wanted to join his grieving wife, Anna, as soon as possible. So he booked passage on the next available ship. While sailing across the Atlantic, the ship's captain summoned Horatio to the bridge. And he informed him that the ship was passing over the very spot where his children had perished. It is recorded that while alone in his cabin, that night, Horatio wrote the words to this now famous hymn. Knowing his story, now listen to the words. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea pillows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet through trial, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. My faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. 
And then, of course, the refrain, it is well with my soul, it is well. It is well with my soul. Horatio was a man of strong faith. But as we know, faith, even obedience, does not guarantee you and I an easy life. But it is our reaction and our responses to the trials of this life that can really make or break us. When we respond with trust in God, when trust is absent, brethren, despair usually follows. It is only when we trust that we find peace in the storm, that we find contentment, that we find the wellness of our souls. And only when we trust fully in God, only then, only then can we proclaim it is well with my soul. No matter what comes our way, you know, as I was preparing today's message and I was looking for scripture references, what I found was a common story that if I look at it from this perspective, <clears throat> It sheds light on what is truly like to fully trust God and what it means to be able to proclaim it is well with my soul when everything, when everything in our life seems to be coming unbuckled. Our story today comes from the book of Daniel and is one of the most commonly used stories from this great book. It is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the fiery furnace. The story is found in Daniel chapters 1 and 3. And if you would, open your Bibles to Daniel. And I encourage you to read the entire account uh, for yourself in your own quiet time. It's quite a story. It really is. Daniel, as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were all Jews. The nation of Judah had been defeated and taken captive by the Babylonians, led by King Nebuchadnezzar. The king ordered that some of the young men be brought and put into service for him, Daniel, as well as Hananiah, or Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, or Azira, Abednego. This includes changing their culture. They had to change their diets, their names, and the desire of the king was that they would also change their loyalty. That is who they trusted and whom they worshiped. As we will see, they did not do the latter. In chapter three, we pick back up in the story. The king has built a huge statue of himself and ordered that at the sound of the instruments, whatever that was, everyone was to stop what they were doing and to bow down and to worship the statue, making the king God instead of the Lord. Let me read for you the account from Daniel chapter 3, and if you would follow along, begin at verse 1 and going through verse 7. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and the provincial office of officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the scythe, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all of the people 
whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. I think old Nebuchadnezzar had inferiority complex. He was king and everyone knew he was king, but he wanted them to show that they knew that he was king. But the boys of our story are not playing his game. They're ones who are going along. There were some that went along and they tattled on him. They told on them. Look at Daniel chapter eight, uh, chapter three, verses eight through 12. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all people to bow down and worship the gold statue. When they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the, lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments, that decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the providence of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Going on to verses 13 to 15. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and he ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue. I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instrument, but if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Let me put it into some Kentucky language for you. The king says, you got to do this. Doesn't matter what you think, you've got to do it. What they say, they said, no. He said, wait, let me give you one more chance. Bow or else. And still... They said, no way. Verses 16 and 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. I feel like most of you know the rest of the story, but just in case, he did throw them in the furnace, just as he said he would. But when they looked in, Jesus had joined them, and they were having a party. Not a hair on the heads was even singed. Verses 19 through 30, Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage and he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up. And they threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, their turbans, their robes, and other garments. And because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw in the three men. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly... Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men. I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, the officials, the governors, and the advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell like smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree of any people, whatever their race or nation or language speak a word against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn from limb to limb and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other god who can rescue you like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the providence of Babylon. <clears throat> Let me get to the meat of the, today's lesson. It's found in Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. The God we serve is able to save us. But even if he does not, we will still trust him. Even if he does not, we will still worship only him. He can save us. But even if he does not, that does not change anything because he is still God. And we trust him in all things. It is well with our soul. Listen to me. The story of Horatio, the story of the furnished boys. Brethren, that should inspire us. God is God in all seasons. He is in control. He is the God of the storm and of the calm. God of the day and of the night. He is God on the mountain and in the valley. And it is only when we trust fully in him, regardless, regardless of our circumstances, of our lives, that we find peace for our souls. When the, feel, when the wheels kind of fall off of our lives, and they do that sometimes, the only place that we can truly find peace, the only place that we can find comfort is trusting God completely. No matter what may come, trusting Him, loving Him, obeying Him, and growing in Him without trust. Without trust, we have no anchor. Without trust, we have no hope. Without trust, we will never be well with our souls. When the hard times come, it is only our trust in him that will get us through. Part of trusting him is obeying him and showing him reverence and honor and glory and praise one way we do that is by taking of the Lord's Supper. To remember just what Jesus did for us. Time to remember his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It is a time to reflect also on our own lives and make sure that we're fully trusting in the Lord. It is well with my soul. Brethren, we need to look at our corner post. We need to make sure that they are secure. And we need to learn to trust. If you look at the world today, we have the pandemic. We have a lot of unrest. A lot of things that are going on. 
And the only one that we can truly trust is God. We need to make sure that we're obeying him and we're following his commands. And as we talked about, one of those corner posts that we have to have is knowledge and that's studying God's word. How can we possibly know his commands? How can we possibly know his promises if we don't study his word? Brethren, it's imperative that we make sure that all of our corner posts are strong, our knowledge, and that brings peace. We need to make sure that we strive to live a Christian life. It's a struggle. It's hard. We're all sinners. We know that and thankful for his grace and his mercy. And that he was willing to die on a cross for our sins. We can have peace with our souls. If you're here this morning and you've never named his name, today would be a great day to do that. To come down this aisle to give me your hand, to give God your heart. Be buried in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life. But you know if you've done that and turned away from him, you don't have peace with your soul. And today would be a great day to ask him for his forgiveness. Let us pray with you and for you. Help us encourage one another. Stay strong in our faith. If you have need of the gospel invitation, won't you come while together we stand and sing. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood.